Hello there, I'm Lloyd Evans. Welcome to Ramacro. You're watching my review of the September 2022 JW Broadcasting episode as hosted by Governing Body member Stephen Lett. Now, as you might imagine, there's a lot for us to get through. So without further ado, let's roll the first clip. Why did Jesus use a sheep illustration to represent people who will gain everlasting life? Undoubtedly, because of the desirable qualities literal sheep have. They're gregarious, having a liking for companionship. They don't like to be alone. And it's a good thing, because without the flock and the protection of the shepherd, they're defenseless if a lion or bear approaches. About all they can do is bleat, Bah! Goodbye, little sheep. Another good quality is that sheep as a whole tend to be peaceful, inoffensive, very different from goats. As little boys, my brother and I would pet the goats that my grandfather had. But if we turned our backs on them, one would often sneak up behind us and butt us for no reason. <laughs> These are some of the desirable characteristics that make sheep an appropriate illustration for good people. But the quality we especially want to focus on is identified at John chapter 10, verses 4 and 5. When he, that is the shepherd, has brought all his own out, he goes ahead of them, and the sheep follow him because they know his voice. They will by no means follow a stranger but will flee from him, because they do not know the voice of strangers. So as you've probably already surmised, this month's broadcast is going to be quite extraordinary. In fact, those of you who've watched it already, and I'm sure many of you watching will have watched it already, will know that Stephen Lett's talk is going to go into some incredibly culty terrain. But right from the outset, it's very clear that this is about control. Stephen Lett wants you all to be his sheep. He wants you to be compliant and subservient. And what's really interesting is that he's expecting this, in fact, demanding this, as someone who in this very talk, is revealing himself to be an utter idiot. They're defenseless if a lion or bear approaches. About all they can do is bleat, Bah! Goodbye, little sheep. I mean, what do you even say about this? This is, again, one of... God's channel to mankind, one of eight people on the planet. So there's nearly eight billion people on the planet. Let's call it eight billion. And of those eight billion, there are eight men, mostly white, as it turns out. There are eight men who are most suited to delivering God's wisdom to mankind. So that's one in a billion. Stephen Lett is a one in a billion man. Well, I think he is a one in a billion man, but not for the reasons he would probably think. How do you take this man seriously? I'm sure there are many Jehovah's Witnesses who dote on his every word and will find reasons to respect him. But the more he toys with his audience like this, the more he speaks to them as though they are first graders, as though they are frankly stupid, the more it's going to niggle, you would like to think, the more Jehovah's Witnesses are going to think, this cannot be wisdom from God, from the all-wise, all-knowing creator of the universe. And before we move on to the next clip, I do just want to revisit this ridiculous anecdote 
involving Stephen and his brother. As little boys, my brother and I would pet the goats that my grandfather had. But if we turned our backs on them, one would often sneak up behind us and butt us for no reason. This is information that I do not need in my mind, Stephen Letts. You know, I need the space for pin numbers. <laughs> I don't need to know that when you were younger, you and your brother Tim, Tim is the name of his brother, were butted by goats when you tried petting them. We all understand that that's something that goats do. And frankly, <laughs> that thing about they butted us for no reason. So apparently they need a reason. <laughs> Stephen and Tim, <laughs> I'm going to do something to you now. <laughs> I'm going to sneak up behind you and butt you. But don't worry, I've got a good reason. Sheep listen to the voice of their shepherd and reject the voice of strangers. Regarding this quality of sheep, the September 1st, 2004 Watchtower said this, A book on Bible lands relates that a visitor once claimed that sheep recognize their shepherd by his dress, not his voice. A shepherd answered that it was the voice they knew. To prove this, he exchanged clothing with a stranger. Dressed in the shepherd's garb, the stranger called the sheep, but they did not respond. They did not know his voice. Yet when the shepherd called them, though he was disguised, the sheep came at once. Please ask yourself, as one of Jehovah's figurative sheep, do I obediently respond to the voice of the fine shepherd and flee from the voice of strangers? Well, let's talk about this. The original stranger was Satan the devil. Like a ventriloquist, he made a serpent appear to talk. But the words were Satan's words. Satan thereby used his voice to slander Jehovah and deceive Eve. Today, Satan continues his work as an evil ventriloquist using not serpents, but human puppets to enunciate his voice, these acting as his agents, either wittingly or unwittingly. Thank you for that warning, Stephen. So, Stephen Letts, governing body member, wants us to be on guard against agents of Satan. Yes, Satan is an evil ventriloquist. He's not a good ventriloquist. <laughs> He's an evil ventriloquist. And he started being a ventriloquist in the Garden of Eden, of course, when he used a snake as a puppet. And I've actually talked about this before. Uh, if Tibor is gracious, a thumbnail will appear to Sushi367, Did Satan Lie to Eve? I do take exception to Stephen's summary of what happened supposedly in the Garden of Eden, but rather than repeat myself, there is the Sushi if you're interested. And Stephen Lett is using the example of the Garden of Eden story to explain that Satan is still up to his old tricks today. He is effectively the puppet master. He is controlling the world. He is behind all sorts of nefarious schemes to undermine pure worship. And you'll have seen shown on the screen during the broadcast this image of Satan. If Tibor is gracious, we can take a look at a close-up. So this is an image from Jehovah's Witness publications showing Satan controlling his agents on earth from heaven. That's the image that Stephen Lett wants you to keep in your minds as his talk progresses. Because what he's doing really is talking about a bogeyman under the bed. He's talking about this hidden, concealed threat, this nefarious character who Jehovah's Witnesses 
should be scared of, should fear. But don't worry, Stephen Lett and his pals are riding to the rescue. They are the shepherd that the sheep should be listening to. And the whole talk really is based on the verse that was read earlier from John chapter 10. But they will by no means follow a stranger, but will flee from him because they do not know the voice of strangers. So the voice of strangers is supposedly the voice of anyone who's critical of the organization or anyone who encourages people to think for themselves, essentially. That's what we're going to see as this JW Broadcasting episode progresses. But before we move on to the next clip, I did just want to draw your attention to this quote from Christopher Hitchens, whose work I personally feel deeply indebted to in giving me the tools to really start thinking for myself. I guess that would make the late Christopher Hitchens an agent of Satan. But what he said about sheep, the sheep shepherd dynamic, came back into my mind as I was watching Stephen Lett's words. You have Stephen Lett, this religious leader, this cultish charlatan, really, really wanting people to be sheep. And here's what Christopher Hitchens said about that. Shepherds don't look after sheep because they love them. Although I do think some shepherds like their sheep too much. They look after their sheep so they can first fleece them and second turn them into meat. That's much more like the priesthood as I know it. Isn't that true? I love how analogies can be turned around on people in this way. And this is especially the case with groups like Jehovah's Witnesses that use analogies all the time and lean on analogies as some kind of proof, as some kind of evidence that what they're saying is true. Well, analogies aren't proof in and of themselves. And once you drill down into some analogies, they start to unravel. In this case, Christopher Hitchens is right. You never see shepherds and sheep together because the shepherds just love being around sheep. Oh, I can't get enough of these sheep. <laughs> I really want to be out in all weathers, putting up with all sorts of unpredictable behavior from my flock of sheep because sheep can be very troublesome. I really want to deal with all these sheep issues for hours on end because I love sheep. No, that's not how it works. They're doing it because it's their job and they're doing it because sheep are livestock and livestock are there to be exploited. But now let's discuss three examples of how our fine shepherd tells us one thing, but Satan's underlings or strangers Tell us something opposite. We must be vigilant to listen to the right voice. Our fine shepherd tells us, as our first example, these words at Matthew chapter 24, verses 45 through 47. Who really is the faithful and discreet slave whom his master appointed over his domestics? to give them their food at the proper time. Happy is that slave if his master on coming finds him doing so. Truly I say to you, he will appoint him over all his belongings. We know the master Jesus found the faithful and discreet slave spiritually feeding right-hearted ones in 1919 and at a future time will appoint him over all his belongings. So what's the implication? Obviously, even now, Jesus fully trusts the faithful slave. And all of us, even individual members of the governing body, should do the same. But what does the voice of strangers say on this subject? Don't trust the faithful slave. He will mislead you. 
And who often have the loudest voice promoting this false message? Apostates. Yes, there we have it. The A word. (laughs) It was always going in this direction, wasn't it? So yes, this is the September 2022 JW Broadcasting episode. And Stephen Lett is cutting to the chase here. He is identifying apostates, people like yours truly, who have left the Jehovah's Witness religion as being Satan's underlings. We're agents of Satan, apparently, under his control. Satan, of course, being the great ventriloquist. And what's happening here is Stephen Lett is proceeding with this rant where he says a number of things about former Jehovah's Witnesses or apostates, whatever you want to call them, some of which are true, some of which aren't really true. For example, he says, What does the voice of strangers say on this subject? Don't trust the faithful slave. He will mislead you. Now, without wishing to brag, I am fairly well known as an apostate, as a former Jehovah's Witness. In fact, I've been doing this now for over 10 years. My channel's quite well known when it comes to exposing Jehovah's Witnesses and exploring their teachings and policies from a critical perspective. I've never once said... Don't trust the faithful slave. He will mislead you. I don't think Stephen Lett or the governing body are the faithful slave. That's a claim they're making. It's not a claim I'm making. They're claiming to be God's channel. I'm not saying don't listen to God's channel. Don't listen to God's appointed faithful slave. I cannot say that because I don't believe they are the faithful slave. So what he's doing here is he is strawmanning apostates. He is putting words in the mouth of apostates like me. And this is, by definition, deception. We're going to see this actually throughout his rant where he commits the very crimes, for want of a better word, that he's accusing apostates of. A great example is where he quotes from Matthew 24, verses 45 to 47. In fact, if Tibor is gracious, maybe we can read on. Maybe we can get some context here and read to the end of verse 51. Who really is the faithful and discreet slave whom his master appointed over his domestics to give them their food at the proper time? Happy is that slave if his master on coming finds him doing so. Truly I say to you, he will appoint him over all his belongings. But if ever that evil slave says in his heart, my master is delaying, And he starts to beat his fellow slaves and to eat and drink with the confirmed drunkards. The master of that slave will come on a day that he does not expect and in an hour that he does not know. And he will punish him with the greatest severity and will assign him his place with the hypocrites. There is where his weeping and the gnashing of his teeth will be. So what we've done here is we've read the verse in context. Interestingly, you're going to see as Stephen Lett's rant continues, one of the things he's going to bemoan about apostates like me is that we apparently take things out of context. You'll just have to take my word for it. You're going to see evidence of this momentarily But that's one of the things that he criticizes apostates for. Well, what's he done here? He's just cut off the quote. He's just cut off the words of Jesus at a point that is convenient to him and left out the context which 
calls into question his authority or adds ambiguity to this faithful and discreet slave narrative. Interestingly, I actually did a sushi on this. Sushi 230. Cook insists Christ's evil slave parable is just a warning. Thumbnail here if Tibor is gracious. Fellow governing body member Kenneth Cook got up on the annual meeting platform recently and said the following. Please note that Jesus was not prophesying that there would be an evil slave. This is a warning, not a prophecy. So let's get this straight. The part of Matthew 24 that's convenient to the Jehovah's Witness leadership is a prophecy. But when it starts saying things that are uncomfortable for the Jehovah's Witness leadership, that suggest that a slave that people who have prominence in God's organization might become corrupt, once it starts saying that, it's no longer a prophecy. It switches from being a prophecy to just a warning. That's what Jehovah's Witnesses are supposed to swallow. And we're considering this verse because it's being used by Stephen Lett in a rant against apostates that will blame apostates for taking things out of context. You, could, you couldn't make it up, could you? Just the hypocrisy of it is eye-watering and even if we put the evil slave thing to one side, I think it's worthwhile considering some other words of Jesus found at Matthew 7, verses 21 to 23. Not everyone saying to me, Lord, Lord, will enter into the kingdom of the heavens, but only the one doing the will of my Father who is in the heavens will. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and expel demons in your name and perform many powerful works in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Get away from me, you workers of lawlessness. You see, what Stephen Lett is doing, what indeed the whole of the governing body are doing in proclaiming themselves to be the faithful and discreet slave is they are self-certifying themselves as spokespersons for God. They are self-certifying themselves as followers of Jesus. But Jesus himself supposedly warned against people who would do this even though they were workers of lawlessness, even though they were doing things that were not the will of my Father who is in the heavens. I'm obviously atheist. I don't actually consider myself Christian anymore. But if you do consider yourself Christian, I think the question you need to be asking is, would it be the will of the Father? Would it be the will of God for families to be separated by mandate of a religious leadership? For children to be abused and their abuse covered up on a database that the authorities have no access to and for people to even be persuaded to die rather than accept certain medical procedures. Would that be the will of the Father? I think that the words in Matthew 7, if you happen to be a believer, if you happen to be a Christian, and especially if you happen to be one of Jehovah's Witnesses, you do well to give some careful thought to whether those words might apply to people like Stephen Lett to people like Tony Morris and David Splain, who preside over so many lies and so much corruption and so much misery that they export on people's lives. 
And it's worth commenting as well, the presuppositional reasoning that Stephen Lett uses, especially where he says, We know the master Jesus found the faithful and discreet slave spiritually feeding right-hearted ones in 1919. How do we know that? Where is the evidence? He's just said something. He's just made an outlandish claim and offered no evidence whatsoever. This is presuppositional reasoning. It's asking you to take something as a given. As I've repeatedly said on this channel, and it's not my words, it's a well-known phrase, extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. If Stephen Lett really wants us to think that Jesus chose the faithful and discreet slave in 1919, where is his evidence? There is no evidence. There isn't even any Bible verse that even remotely points to 1919. There's nothing linking the years 1914 and 1919 in terms of periods of time described in the Bible. There's nothing. There is absolutely nothing. But isn't this the whole point? Isn't this the reason why Stephen Lett wants you to be a sheep? Especially if you're one of Jehovah's Witnesses. Especially if you are following him or listening to his voice. The reason why he wants you to be terrified of the voice of strangers, particularly the voice of people like me, apostates who question his teachings, the reason why he wants you to be so scared is because his words don't make any sense. He cannot offer you any evidence whatsoever for some of the foundational teachings of the Jehovah's Witness religion. He cannot prove the theology behind 1914. He cannot prove that Jerusalem was destroyed in 607. And he sure as hell can't prove that Jesus chose the faithful and discreet slave in 1919 when there isn't even a Bible verse that can be pointed to in support of that teaching. Hebrews 13.9 labels false messages as strange teachings. Yes, they are the teachings of strangers. Some examples of their strange teachings are that the faithful slave protects pedophiles, or that slave will exploit you so they can live lives of luxury. Those are both bald-faced lies. Acts 20.30 says that apostates speak twisted things. They do this in order to draw God's sheep away and make them followers of themselves. Something that's twisted is bent out of shape or distorted. Wow, thank you for explaining what twisted means, Stephen. I'm really expanding my vocabulary with this show. They speak twisted things by leaving out vital details, taking things out of context, or in some other way, manipulating a truth into a lie or into a misleading half-truth. 2 Peter 2.3 says, They will greedily exploit you with counterfeit words. A counterfeit is something that's carefully designed to look like the real thing. Seriously, who needs Sesame Street when we've got Stephen giving us all of these definitions? Take, for example, counterfeit money. It might look genuine, but it's fake and thus worthless. If we're deceived into accepting it, we'll lose money. But if we're deceived into accepting the counterfeit words of apostate, We'll lose our life. Ah, oh, a death threat. How charming. And apostates will give us absolutely nothing of value in exchange. Can you imagine really needing a loving shepherding visit and asking apostates to give you one? Wow. So much to unpack there. I hardly know where to start. Let's start at the end, shall we? At the words that are still fresh in our minds and work backwards from there. So 
Stephen Lett's knockout punch when it comes to dismissing apostates as people who shouldn't be listened to as the voice of strangers is that they give us absolutely nothing of value in exchange. We don't need to offer a surrogate set of beliefs, Stephen Lett. We don't need to take your lies and say, hey, we'll give you even better lies. We don't need to come up with some alternative theology to dupe people with. What apostates like myself offer is simply the freedom to think for yourself. That's what we're offering. And it's not something you have to take. If you'd prefer to have clowns like Stephen Lett micromanage your life for you, go right ahead. I won't lose any sleep. But if you're of the mindset that you don't appreciate being exploited and lied to, I would recommend being in control of your own mind and being in control of your own life. And that will always be infinitely better than any fantasy that Stephen Lett has to offer, than any shepherding visits. I mean, apparently... That's that's where we're going wrong. Apostates need to be offering shepherding visits in order for our arguments to make sense. It doesn't even deserve a response. What a ludicrous suggestion. If you need help with your mental health, if you're depressed or anxious or feeling the effects of some kind of trauma, which, let's be honest, this organization is usually the cause of, if you need help with your mental health, go to a professional. (laughs) That's what people like myself are saying. We're not saying that you should follow us. We're not saying that we should visit your home and give you shepherding visits, we're saying that you are strong enough to look after yourself. And if you're not strong enough, the people to help you with your mental health are trained mental health professionals. And we're also saying that rather than believing in things just because you want them to be true, Rather than believing in fantasies involving pandas and watermelons that conveniently allow Stephen Lett to have control over you, why don't you apply critical thinking? Why don't you decide for yourself what your beliefs are based on the facts, based on logic and reason? That's the alternative that people like myself are offering. We're certainly not suggesting that you should come and follow us. But isn't it interesting that it's we apostates who are apparently in the business of twisting things? They speak twisted things by leaving out vital details, taking things out of context, or in some other way, manipulating a truth into a lie or into a misleading half-truth. I'm just going to say it now. Stephen Lett makes himself guilty of all of these things in this very broadcast. Stephen Lett has already taken out of context the words of Jesus in Matthew 24 regarding the faithful and discreet slave and the warning regarding the evil slave He's already taken that out of context when we're talking about leaving out vital details. There's an example of him doing precisely this here. Some examples of their strange teachings are that the faithful slave protects pedophiles or that slave will exploit you so they can live lives of luxury. So we have two examples of strange teachings. Number one, the faithful slave protects pedophiles. And number two, 
The slave will exploit you so that they can live lives of luxury. This first claim, the faithful slave protects pedophiles. Again, as I've argued, I'm not calling them the faithful slave. They can call themselves that if they want. But I don't call them the faithful slave. I'll call them the governing body if that's the title that they insist on. But I don't think they were chosen by Jesus. But as for this claim about protecting pedophiles, that is absolutely true because they keep a database of those accused of child sexual abuse. And this is something that they don't even try to deny. They've nowhere said in their videos or in their literature, we don't keep a database of those accused of child abuse. And the reason that they're not going to do that is because this database, there's documented evidence to support it. In Australia, when Australia had its Royal Commission, they went to Watchtower Australia and they pulled records of 1,006 perpetrators of child abuse from the database in Australia. And there's even indications in the Shepherd book, the manual that elders have in their briefcases, that records are kept when it comes to those accused of child abuse. So there's documented evidence about this and examples of where people have actually had partial access to the database. That is quintessentially protecting pedophiles. Because if you are keeping a list of accused pedophiles and not passing that on to the authorities, what you're doing is you are protecting pedophiles by making it so that they don't face justice and are therefore in a position to accrue more victims. That's, I'm sorry, there's no other way to describe it. And yet apparently that's a bald-faced lie. But what Stephen Lett hasn't done there is give details. He's just made a statement and he's not given, what was the word, he's not given vital details so that Jehovah's Witnesses can have clarity and transparency regarding this particular issue, this profoundly important issue that he's just skirting over. And I mentioned before straw manning. Straw manning is where you put an argument in your opponent's mouth that isn't what they've said. Apparently one thing that I'm doing as an apostate is saying that the slave will exploit you so that they can live lives of luxury. Well, that's quite a sweeping statement, and it's not something I've said in so many words on this channel. I do think that Stephen Lett lives a life of luxury. I think that's manifestly obvious when you consider the position they're in. These are men who want for nothing, who fly around the world and are received everywhere they go by doting followers. They don't have to worry about paying bills. They get all of their meals and their accommodation provided for them. They don't seem to be lacking when it comes to their budget for jewellery <laughs> and Rolex watches and, in Sam Hurd's case, womb chairs. So they do seem to have money to spend, in Tony Morris's case, on very fine whiskey, in Stephen Lett's case, on real estate investments, which I'll come to. But I have not said on this channel, because I can't prove it, and I don't say things that I can't prove, I have not said that this is all just some huge racket. It could be. That might be something that comes out of the closet in the future. But as of now, we do not have direct evidence, documented evidence, that the members of the governing body are personally enriching themselves directly from dedicated funds, from money that gets contributed to the organisation, 
for all we know, they're making their money through some other means. We, we just don't know. We can't say that with any certainty. I understand that there will be some who do say that, but personally speaking, that's not a line of argument that I go down. They do live lives of luxury, yes, but to what extent are they profiting from their followers? I think that that's ambiguous, and I've always had roughly that position on this channel. So what he's doing is he is twisting the words of apostates. He's strawmanning apostates, putting words in the mouths of apostates, and essentially living up to the very criticisms that he's directing at apostates. And regarding that part about taking things out of context, we've already discussed the way Matthew 24 was taken out of context. What about Hebrews 13 verse 9? Hebrews 13.9 labels false messages as strange teachings. Yes, they are the teachings of strangers. Hebrews 13 verse 9 labels false messages as strange teachings. Does it now, Stephen Lett? Isn't it interesting that that verse doesn't get quoted so that people can make their own minds up regarding that verse? Let's read it, shall we? Hebrews 13 verse 9. Do not be led astray by various and strange teachings, for it is better for the heart to be strengthened by undeserved kindness than by foods which do not benefit those occupied with them. <laughs> Maybe I've missed something, viewers, but I haven't seen anywhere in that verse the Apostle Paul say that the strange teachings are false messages or false teachings. It's actually quite ambiguous as to what he means. And interestingly, there's a footnote for the verse uh, next to where it says about foods. It says that is rules about food. So evidently the strange teachings that are being referred to here are strange or various ideas regarding dietary restrictions of some kind. That's To say that that's directly calling out false messages from apostates is at best a stretch and at worst outright misleading twisting of the scriptures and taking the words of the Bible out of context, which is again exactly the sort of shady behaviour Stephen Lett is accusing apostates of. I think ultimately what we have here is an organisation in full-on panic mode, the more they jump up and down about apostates, the more they point to the bogeyman under the bed, the more they try to terrify Jehovah's Witnesses when it comes to criticism of the organization and the need to avoid it, the more desperate they show themselves to be. They obviously did it at last year's 2021 convention. In fact, if Tibor is gracious... A thumbnail will appear to a video, everything they said about apostates at the 2021 convention. They really went to town at that particular convention with the whole fear-mongering surrounding apostates. And now we see Stephen Lett revisiting this. I, I mean, were Jehovah's Witnesses just not paying attention the first time round? Why the need for the repetition? It was literally the 2021 convention when you were saying all this, and now you're saying it all again. Your criticisms of apostates are frankly what we heard already, only last year. Is this an admission on your part that the sheep, Jehovah's Witnesses, aren't paying attention to you? Are you losing control? That's the feeling I'm getting. 
But what I really want Jehovah's Witnesses to take home from this particular rebuttal is how shady they are in their fear-mongering and particularly the way they strawman the apostate position and speak with such vagueness when it comes to criticisms against the organization, leaving out, as they say, vital details. If you're going to counter criticism of your organization, discuss the details. Talk about the precise claims regarding child sexual abuse and show how they are bald-faced lies. Stephen Lett isn't going to do that because he can't do that because they're not bald-faced lies. We must be careful about believing everything presented in the media about Jehovah's Organization. Remember, the media is commonly motivated by prejudice, hatred, and a desire for profit. False and exaggerated news reports are very common. For example, in one European country, many people were indignant when an emotional press report stated that a young female witness died because she refused a blood transfusion. Were those the complete facts? No. The patient refused a blood transfusion on religious grounds, but she did agree to alternative non-blood medical management. This could have been implemented immediately and likely would have saved her life. However, the hospital delayed matters unnecessarily until it was too late. The press report didn't mention these facts. While it's unreasonable to distrust all secular sources of information, we must be wary. 1 John 5.19 says, The whole world is lying in the power of the wicked one. Is it really now? So apparently now it's the turn of the news media to be on the receiving end of Stephen Lett's wrath in the September 2022 JW Broadcasting episode. As we just heard there, the whole world, the whole world is under Satan's control, including the news media. And that's why Jehovah's Witnesses should be skeptical when it comes to any information about their religion printed or broadcast in the media. Exhibit A, an example in one European country regarding a young female witness who died refusing a blood transfusion. We don't know the country. We obviously don't know the name of the witness. We don't know which news article is being talked about here. We can't independently verify what Stephen Lett is saying or the way Stephen Lett is characterizing this story. Let's remember what Stephen Lett has only just said regarding the words of apostates. They speak twisted things by leaving out vital details. Where are the vital details in this story, Stephen? This is your example, the definitive example, to show that Jehovah's Witnesses cannot trust the media and you're making it as vague as you possibly can so that it's impossible for us to verify your version of events, so that it's impossible for us to, say, speak to the doctors to find out whether they can corroborate what you're saying. But hey, who needs doctors? Because apparently Stephen Lett knows that non-blood medical management would have saved this young woman. The patient refused a blood transfusion on religious grounds, but she did agree to alternative non-blood medical management. This could have been implemented immediately and likely would have saved her life. So he's a doctor now. Fantastic. Stephen Lett who can just about tell us the rudimentary meanings of words, 
and who talks down to his audience, infantilizes them in broadcast after broadcast, seems to barely have a grip on things himself, is now in a position to be telling trained medical personnel that he's right and they're wrong. And that in a specific case, or should I say a non-specific case, because he's not giving us any details, in a specific case, non-blood medical management would have likely saved a woman's life. This is the level of arrogance, of presumptuousness of the governing body. This is supposed to be faithful and discreet. This is supposed to be wisdom, folks. And yet here's Stephen Lettis claiming to know everything about how a particular patient should have been treated and more importantly, making himself an utter hypocrite by falling foul of the very criticism he has only just levelled at apostates, who he claims leave out vital details. Thank you, Stephen, for immediately walking into the stereotype that you have carved out for others. You utter hypocrite. I'm sorry, there's no other word for it. And what I find supremely ironic about all of this fear-mongering regarding the media is that when it comes to journalists and the media, this is an organization that likes to have it both ways. And if you don't know what I'm talking about, here is a clip from Paul Gillies, who is head of the Office of Public Information, or OPI, at World Headquarters, speaking at the 2018 annual meeting. OPI at World Headquarters has over the years been assigned by the governing body to convey accurate information to the news media and academics. But as Satan intensifies his slanderous attacks on Jehovah's people and opposes feed authorities with twisted and distorted statements about us, OPI's assignment now includes conveying accurate words of truth to government officials. Regarding Russia, OPI uh, keeps various officials around the world informed of the ongoing harassment and unjust detentions of our brothers. As a result, many of these authorities have issued strongly worded statements condemning the ban in Russia, some of which you can find on the JW Org newsroom. Meanwhile, OPI communicated with journalists about Russia one of whom wrote a very interesting article for the international edition of Newsweek. This article appeared on the front cover, and this one outlet alone has published about 30 articles about the oppression of Jehovah's Witnesses, not just in Russia, but other countries. This is what's called having it both ways. So on the one hand, according to Stephen Lett, Satan is an evil ventriloquist who is using not serpents, but human puppets to enunciate his voice. And he also says, first John 5.19 says, the whole world is lying in the power of the wicked one. So Stephen Lett has repeatedly warned Jehovah's Witnesses in this September 2022 broadcast that the whole world is under Satan's control, the whole world, including the media, and that the media mustn't be trusted. While, on the other hand, it seems the media can be trusted at least a little bit, at least in so far as the OPI, the Office of Public Information, is able to feed it the Jehovah's Witness narrative is able to put their spin on articles that are being researched. And they even, in this 2018 annual meeting clip, Paul Gillies brandishes the front cover of Newsweek and essentially brags that his department helped in the writing or helped in the creation 
of an article on Jehovah's Witnesses regarding Russia that the OPI and indeed the organization is quite clearly proud of, otherwise they wouldn't be showing the front cover at the annual meeting. So which is it? Are Jehovah's Witnesses supposed to distrust the media and view it as being under Satan's control, or is the media not under Satan's control and actually, is it possible for Jehovah's Witnesses to tell the media, to tell individual journalists what to write about them? Both cannot be true. What you have here is propaganda, is fear-mongering, is an attempt at controlling information. This is all alluded to in Stephen Hassan's bite model if you think about it, BITE standing for behavior, information, thoughts, and emotions. When you can control those things, you can control a person. And what the organization is showing that it can do here is control information, not just control what journalists write about the organization, but control Jehovah's Witnesses into being distrustful by default regarding journalism, regarding the media, just in case the media writes something about Jehovah's Witnesses that the organization isn't happy with, that in fact is fair and objective about Jehovah's Witnesses and helps to warn people away from Jehovah's Witnesses and expose the organization as being corrupt and abusive. Now, let's discuss a second example of the voice of our fine shepherd Jesus. Matthew chapter 5, verses 27 and 28. Jesus said, You heard that it was said, You must not commit adultery. But I say to you, that everyone who keeps on looking at a woman so as to have a passion for her, has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Our fine shepherd is telling us not only to avoid sexual immorality, but also to flee from anything that could lead to it, such as immoral thoughts. And at Matthew 19, 9, our fine shepherd tells us, I say to you that whoever divorces his wife except on the grounds of sexual immorality, and marries another, commits adultery. Here Jesus makes clear that the only valid basis for divorce and remarriage in God's eyes is if a disloyal mate commits sexual immorality. But what's the voice of strangers of Satan's world telling us regarding divorce, adultery, and other forms of sexual immorality. No problem. It's your choice. You have the freedom to do what you want. In fact, in order to make sexual immorality appear more innocent, it's often euphemized. Sexual perversion, such as homosexuality, is called an alternative lifestyle. One so-called expert said, it's simply like being left-handed. Pornography is called adult entertainment. Adulterous betrayal of one's marriage mate is called having an affair. Many call getting married old-fashioned and see nothing wrong with living together without marriage. We've been watching governing body member Stephen Lett taking us through the September JW Broadcasting episode. Stephen here wants to talk to us about morality. Stephen Lett, governing body member, one of eight leaders presiding over an organization that covers up child sexual abuse on an industrial scale and breaks apart families through shunning, leading some to suicide and persuades his followers to refuse blood transfusions, even if it leads to their deaths. 
This is a man who wants to talk about morals. And I think it's worth just taking a step back and viewing these words in context because what we've seen in the September broadcast is effectively Stephen Lett setting out the stall of the governing body. He's used very black and white ideology to create this us versus them narrative regarding apostates and the media and essentially anyone outside his sphere of control or the governing body's sphere of control. He's asking his followers or Jehovah's Witnesses to be distrustful by default of anyone who might be critical of the governing body's authority. But aside from that message, ultimately what is he doing? He is justifying his authority or the governing body's authority. First of all, by referring to the verse in Matthew 24, verse 45, about the faithful and discreet slave, very selectively, and stripping the verse of context. And now what he's doing is essentially giving the manifesto of Jehovah's Witnesses. This is all about sex, apparently. That's what makes the governing body or the faithful and discreet slave so special is that they know what's good and what's bad about sex and they're interested in policing sex. Whereas others in the world, in Satan's system of things, are less interested or not interested at all in policing sex. This is something that Stephen Lett is proud of. He's proud of the sexual repression in his organization. And he and his colleagues are frankly obsessed with making sure that their followers do sex or don't do sex according to their liking. That's what all of this is about. I've commented before that if you go through the Shepherd book, this is the secret manual for Jehovah's Witness elders that the rank and file members don't get to read. The number of pages allocated for discussing sex rules far outweighs the number of pages for discussing things like physical assault or theft or any of those issues. You're not going to see Stephen Lett talking about how it would be terrible to be violently abusive or how it would be terrible to commit fraud or any of those things. What he's doing is <laughs> narrowing the message down to, well, look at what we say about sex. That, that's his first thing on the list, apart from talking about the faithful and discreet slave. That's the first thing he wants us to be thinking about. And I think that alone is extremely telling. If you think about it, it's something that Jehovah's Witnesses have in common with all manifestations of religious fundamentalism, this obsession with sex, as though the creator of the universe, who sits arms folded through the Holocaust, who watches entire families, entire communities be brutalized and destroyed in war after war, including the war in Ukraine, who lets loose pandemics on his creation and watches as the body count climbs. This is a God who says, but what I'm most interested in is sex. Let's forget about all the misery and suffering and let's talk about sex, baby. <laughs> That seems to be what God's all about. He created humankind to procreate and is especially interested, more interested than 
ending suffering or holding people accountable for causing suffering, he's especially interested, it seems, in how people use their genitals with consenting sexual partners. That's what he is most interested in, which is a bit perverse, don't you think? And I think it takes a special kind of mindset to be wishing to do the policing on God's behalf, which is what Stephen Lett's talking about here. I'm, again, I hardly know where to begin with all of this, but let's deal with this first quote where Stephen Lett says, But what's the voice of strangers of Satan's world telling us regarding divorce? adultery, and other forms of sexual immorality. No problem. It's your choice. You have the freedom to do what you want. Apparently that's a negative. <laughs> it's a negative for people to want to do what they want, for people to have autonomy, for people to not have their lives, including their sex lives, micromanaged by clowns like Stephen Lett. He is deriding people who assert their freedom of choice in these matters. He also says, In fact, in order to make sexual immorality appear more innocent, it's often euphemized. Sexual perversion, such as homosexuality, is called an alternative lifestyle. One so-called expert said, it's simply like being left-handed. What is it with Stephen Lett and bashing gay people? I mean, the man really has it in for the LGBTQ plus community, doesn't he? He has form here. So if you don't know what I'm talking about, if Tibor is gracious, you will see some thumbnails there was Stephen Lett's anti-gay convention rant. I, as I recall, that was at the 2020 convention. Then, more recently, at this year's convention, uh, Sushi 333 deals with Stephen Lett aiming a fresh dig at the LGBTQ plus community. As I've covered on this channel... It seems that Stephen Lett is personally connected with this issue because I had the pleasure of interviewing his niece, Brandy Schmiedel, who divulged that Stephen Lett's nephew, her brother, committed suicide as a gay man who was raised in a Jehovah's Witness environment. And it was not long after the death of this man that Stephen Lett gave that first rant at the 2020 convention. So this is a man who should understand what sexual repression does to people and the way it can drive people to the brink, beyond the brink even. And yet he doubles down. He really does insist that he should be able to tell people who they love, who they have sexual relationships with. This is what we're dealing with. And this is quite frankly why so many who are raised in the Jehovah's Witness religion, I feel get messed up when it comes to sex and sexuality. It leaves its mark on people psychologically. You do not tamper with people's sexuality and tell them who they're allowed to love and whether they're allowed to masturbate or not and whether they're allowed to be gay or straight. You do not tell them that they're only allowed to explore any kind of relationship so long as it's within a marriage and so long as it's within the members of a certain religious group. You don't do all that without it messing with people on a profound level. 
we're dealing with a really intimate, deep part of our psyche as humans, aren't we? And that's the area, that's the level at which people like Stephen Lett want to have a say. It's also worth noting that Stephen Lett has pulled the same old trick of citing the unnamed expert. <laughs> what is it with governing body members attributing quotes to unnamed people so that we can't fact check, we can't verify what's been said and in what context. This coming from someone who has only just been moaning about how apostates leave out details and don't provide information in its proper context. And here he is making a sweeping remark about gay people based on the words of one so-called expert who apparently said that being gay is simply like being left-handed. No name given. And it's based on this sort of sweeping remark that can't be fact-checked that millions of people are supposed to cede control of their sexuality to people like Stephen. And... Before we move on to the next part, because there's more to say on this whole issue of morality, particularly as it relates to domestic violence, before we move on, I hope you caught what Stephen Letts said about porn. Pornography is called adult entertainment. So that's pretty much all Stephen Lett has to say in this lengthy rant on morals regarding pornography. He resents the fact that pornography is called adult entertainment. And just while we're on this point of pornography, I feel it's worthwhile pointing your attention again to the Shepherd the Flock of God book. I've already mentioned that this book has pages and pages and pages about sex and sex rules. It has a whole chapter on pornography there's the page heading. don't know whether it's coming up on the camera. Yes, it is. So that's the first page on pornography. You can be disfellowshipped for viewing porn, but it depends what porn. It depends whether it's abhorrent or not. And all of this circles back to essentially homosexuality. Almost as though the rules were written by straight dudes, isn't it? <laughs> Under the heading, determining whether a judicial hearing is required, it says the deliberate viewing of pornography is a sin. It can result in an addiction to sex, perverted desires, and serious marital problems. However, not all cases require handling by a judicial committee. An entrenched practice of viewing, perhaps over a considerable period of time, abhorrent forms of pornography would be considered gross uncleanness with greediness and needs to be handled judicially. Such abhorrent forms of pornography include homosexuality, brackets, sex between those of the same gender. The paragraph continues. I'm not going to say all of it because I'm mindful of YouTube and monetization and that kind of thing. But let's just skip to that final sentence. It is equally wrong for a man or woman to watch two women engaged in homosexual activity as it is for a man or woman to watch two men engaged in homosexual activity. So it's all about homosexuality. You can watch straight porn and you'll just be given a slapped wrist. But if it's gay porn, it's a sin. Well, all porn is apparently a sin, but if it's gay porn, you can be disfellowshipped and estranged from your family. So that's how arbitrary this stuff is. 
Stephen Lett can skirt over porn and complain about it being called adult entertainment if he wants, but I'm going to drag him back to what he's actually written or his organisation has actually written on this. And in my opinion, it's a double standard. And it's manifestly a bunch of arbitrary rules written by a particular demographic, written by straight people who, for whatever reason, feel threatened by the existence of gay people. This world's media is very skillful at presenting something bad as good. For example, in a movie, a female character might be portrayed as having a husband who is abusive. You like the woman, and you, you want her to find happiness. Then, a handsome man starts working in her office, and he's so nice to her. There's an attraction between them, and the budding romance is presented as something good. Soft background music makes it hard to consider her course to be bad. It's easy to keep watching and hope she leaves her marriage mate and runs off with her workmate. And usually that's what happens. So easily we can forget that Jehovah and Jesus hate adultery and unscriptural divorce. But when we reject the voice of this world and listen to the voice of Jehovah and Jesus, we bring protection and blessings to ourselves and others. So now we're talking about domestic violence. And just as a recap, this is a man, Stephen Lett, who fancies himself as an expert on morality. He claims to be a governing body member, an anointed governing body member, handpicked by God, no less. And he claims to be part of God's channel with mankind. And he claims that his morals or the morals of his organization uniquely qualify his organization to tell people how to run their lives. And yet, what is he advocating when it comes to domestic violence by means of this illustration? I found it quite telling when he talked about soft background music. Soft background music makes it hard to consider her course to be bad. So her course is apparently bad. We'll get to that later. But I love the fact that a man who is on the teaching committee of the governing body, a man who on a day-to-day -day basis involves himself in the video propaganda that gets churned out by this organization, is lamenting the way soft background music can be used to make a negative message a positive message. He's lamenting the way music can be used to manipulate people as someone who uses music in precisely this way. You don't need me to show you examples. If you watch enough Jehovah's Witness propaganda, the sort that gets reviewed on this channel, you'll be able to call to mind example after example of where they play soft background music to make you more emotionally engaged in what's being said. To make what's being said sound more appealing. And he apparently can't stand the way other people do this, but it's apparently fine for his organisation to do it. It's apparently fine for him to do it. It's utter hypocrisy. But that aside... Let's recall what he's talking about in this illustration. He's talking about a movie with a female character who is portrayed as having a husband who is abusive. For example, in a movie, a female character might be portrayed as having a husband who is abusive. A husband who is 
abusive. So there's no ambiguity here. It's not the husband might be abusive or they're having marital problems. It's a definitive statement. The husband is abusive. If someone's in an abusive relationship, they should get out of it, shouldn't they? But the whole point of Stephen Lett's illustration is that she shouldn't get out of that abusive relationship. She shouldn't get a divorce from her abusive husband if the abusive husband hasn't cheated on her. It would be wrong for her to pursue a relationship with someone else if she doesn't have a divorce from her husband. It would be, you might even say, more wrong for her to move on with her life and find someone new than the abuse that she was suffering. That seems to be the message here. I don't think I'm exaggerating. And what we have here is almost a drive-by of the governing body's disgusting policy when it comes to domestic violence. I've done a video before on this, on the January 2018 Watchtower article, thumbnail here if Tibor is gracious. Let's actually read two paragraphs from that article, just in case you're watching this as someone who doesn't know much about Jehovah's Witnesses and thinks I might be exaggerating, or maybe you're one of Jehovah's Witnesses and you just haven't thought this through yet. And I'm going to be honest, that was kind of where my head was at when I was first waking up to the fact that this isn't the truth. So December 2018, Watchtower. Let's look at page 14, paragraphs 17 and 18. Admittedly, there have been instances where an unbelieving husband seems to prove that he is not agreeable to staying with her. He might be extremely physically abusive, even to the point that she feels that her health or life is in danger. He might refuse to support her and the family or severely endanger her spirituality. In such cases, some Christians have personally decided that despite what he might say, the mate is not agreeable to staying together and that a separation is necessary. But other Christians in comparably difficult situations have not. They have endured and tried to work at improving matters. Why? So apparently, an extremely physically abusive marriage mate should be endured in some situations, even if they are endangering their spouse's health or life. Let's read on. Paragraph 18. In such a separation, the two are still marriage mates. If they lived apart, each one would face challenges, as mentioned earlier. The Apostle Paul gave another reason for staying united. He wrote, The unbelieving husband is sanctified in relation to his wife, and the unbelieving wife is sanctified in relation to the brother. Otherwise, your children would be unclean, but now they are holy." Many loyal Christians have remained with an unbelieving mate under very trying circumstances. They can testify that doing so was worthwhile in a special sense when their mate became a true worshipper. So what this is really saying, if you read between the lines, is... If you are with an unbelieving husband, if you're a Jehovah's Witness woman with an unbelieving husband who is extremely physically abusive, who is endangering your health and life, it might be worthwhile staying with them so that they can become a true worshipper. 
apparently the most important thing here is that there's an opportunity for someone to become a Jehovah's Witness. Never mind that life is in the balance, that there could be a death, that someone is endangering someone's life. The main thing is that Jehovah's Witnesses benefit in some way by adding to their numbers. And this is an organization that wants to lecture us on morals. But now, our third example of the voice of our fine shepherd is at Matthew chapter 6, and we're going to read verses 19 and 20. Stop storing up for yourselves treasures on the earth, where moth and rust consume, and where thieves break in and steal. Rather, store up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust consumes, and where thieves do not break in and steal. We're told that our focus should be on spiritual things and not on physical things. And this is especially true when thinking about where we are in the stream of time, in the final part of the final part of the last days. But what's the voice of strangers of this world on this subject? Exert yourself vigorously to acquire material possessions. Pursue things that will make your life comfortable, because that is what will bring you happiness. The question is, to whom are we listening? Jehovah and Jesus tell us to be content now with a spiritual paradise and to concentrate on our life-saving preaching work and that they will provide a physical paradise later. We're watching Stephen Lett taking us through the September JW Broadcasting episode, and now he's talking to us about materialism. Stephen Lett really doesn't like the idea of people making themselves comfortable in Satan's system of things, and he feels that the world around us is geared towards making people chase money. I guess you could say there's an argument for that, but the reality is that there are many who don't chase money, irrespective of what advertising they watch or the way certain people live their lives. Manifestly, it's the case that some people are more materialistic than others irrespective of religion. I think that's self-evident. I think we all intuitively know this, but that's not how Stephen Lett wants us to think about materialism. Stephen Lett wants us to think that we're being told, exert yourself vigorously to acquire material possessions. But what's the voice of strangers of this world on this subject? Exert yourself vigorously to acquire material possessions. Pursue things that will make your life comfortable, because that is what will bring you happiness. If you say so, I guess, but I'm sorry, I'm just not seeing it. I think some people are and always will be materialistic, and some people are not. But what we have here is just another sweeping generalization, a great example of black and white ideology. Our organization says this, Satan's world says something different. There can be no nuance, there can be no provision for people in Satan's world having different ideas on the issue of materialism. We'll come back to materialism because Stephen Lett has more to say on this. And the more he talks about it, the more he demonstrates himself to be a total hypocrite, as I'm going to come to. But I do just want to revisit Stephen Lett's remarkable doubling down on his rhetoric about the last days. And this is especially true 
when thinking about where we are in the stream of time, in the final part of the final part of the last days. So the events unfolding around us are making clearer than ever that we're living in the final part of the last days, undoubtedly the final part of the final part of the last days, shortly before the last day of the last days. Isn't it interesting that we've been in the final part of the final part of the last days already for two years now? This was when Stephen Lett first coined that phrase. The final part of the final part of the last days, shortly before the last day of the last days, it was probably the most notable example of the Jehovah's Witness organization leaping on the COVID pandemic as an opportunity to spread fear-mongering and doomsday ideas that the apocalypse is coming, the end is nigh. You'd think Stephen Lett would be embarrassed about this. <laughs> Anyone with any kind of self-awareness would be thinking, God, I can't believe I got so carried away. Because the rhetoric back then was implying that this is it, you know, we're right at the end now because there's a pandemic. Only two years on, more than two years on, the situation is changed. We're still in the pandemic, but life-saving medicine has been developed. Precautions have been implemented. In many countries, those precautions have been rolled back. But nonetheless, humanity has risen to the challenge of dealing with the coronavirus pandemic to the point where even Stephen Lett and his organization have been promoting the vaccine that has been developed by worldly scientists. And yet Stephen Lett's apparently still proud of his jumping up and down at the outset of the pandemic, claiming that here we are in the final part of the final part of the last days. The phrase last days, those words become more and more meaningless, don't they? The more this organization claims to be right at the end of the last days or in the final part of the last days, and the more it does this over not just months or years, but decades, all the way through its history, if you go back in the literature, the more the term last days gets diluted to the point where it's practically meaningless. 1 Peter 2.11 indicates that we should view ourselves as temporary residents who are just passing through this old system and headed for the real life in the new world. What do we mean by temporary resident? Well, imagine that you rent an old house to live in while a new, beautiful house is being built for you. You'll live there only a few months. Would you install a new concrete driveway? Would you put in new electrical wiring and plumbing? Would you install brand new vinyl siding? No. You might do a few cosmetic things to make your stay a little more comfortable, but you wouldn't do anything major. Why? Because you know you're just a temporary resident and that soon you'll move into your beautiful new home. Well, if we think of ourselves just as temporary residents in this old system, it'll be a real protection against the materialism that is promoted by the voice of strangers. Stephen Lett there talking about the need to be temporary residents or view ourselves as temporary residents as it relates to materialism. We shouldn't get too involved in Satan's system of things, in making our lives comfortable in Satan's system of things, because it's all just temporary. We should be working towards 
God's new system and furthering kingdom interests instead of making our lives comfortable in the here and now. That's the message. And again, Stephen Lett is being a total hypocrite here. You may remember earlier in this broadcast, Stephen Lett alluded to having a brother. As little boys, my brother and I would pet the goats that my grandfather had. But if we turned our backs on them, one would often sneak up behind us and butt us for no reason. So Stephen Letts has a brother, and I can reveal his brother's name is Timothy. Here, if Tibor is gracious, is a picture of Timothy Lett. And we can go on better if you like. We can actually see news footage of Stephen Lett's brother Timothy because as it happens, Timothy was on the news back in, I think, 2019 when his restaurant got engulfed in a fire. There it was here for a while. You know, I worked on it for 18 years and it was about two years people got to enjoy. I had a campaign poster in there of Franklin Delano Roosevelt when he ran for president. You know, there was a bronze cannon and we're still looking for it because I can't believe the bronze cannon melted. I'm a pretty old guy, you know. <laughs> Some, anybody need two acres of ground, you know, come see me. That's what I'm saying. So that was Timothy Lett reacting to the fire that unfortunately ravaged his restaurant business. You might be wondering why I'm talking about Stephen's brother, Timothy. It's because of a discovery that was made actually not on this channel, but on the Blue Envelope channel. A thumbnail will appear, if Tibor is gracious, to a video from that channel, which brought our attention to details of a financial transaction involving Stephen and Timothy Lett. They invested in property together. And there are documents to prove this. So if Tibor is gracious, you will also see a document from 2013, State of Alabama, County of Baldwin, Vendors Lien Deed, if you scroll down, you'll perhaps see a figure quoted of half a million dollars. And you'll also see the names Timothy R. Lett and Mark Stephen Lett, along with his wife, Susan Lynn Lett. So this is a property transaction where Stephen and his wife, Susan, have gone in halves on a $500,000 property. So 250,000 on Timothy's side or Tim's side and 250,000 on Stephen and Susan's side. You can see there the location of the property is lots one and two Lagoon Park in Baldwin County, Alabama, this is a waterfront property. It's an investment property. And the document goes on to stipulate all the whys and wherefores of the transaction. But essentially, this is documented, signed, notarized evidence that Stephen Lett, with his wife Susan, are involved in the property market. Now, there's nothing wrong with being involved in the property market. There's nothing wrong in investing in property. Where I have a problem is the hypocrisy of moralizing about materialism and this idea of being temporary residents while you are personally acting to the contrary because you are making yourself comfortable. You are investing in property for the long term. If Stephen Lett really, really considers these to be 
the last days or the final part of the final part of the last day of the last days, whatever. What's he doing investing in property in Satan's system of things? And furthermore, where does this put him in relation to the vow of poverty? If all of this sounds familiar, it may be because I've already touched on this. I did a sushi on the hypocrisy of Stephen Lett when it comes to materialism, because this isn't the only occasion on which Stephen Lett has been moralizing on the issue of materialism. It seems to be one of his pet subjects, telling followers not to be materialistic. But in this sushi video, I explain that there is such a thing as the vow of poverty, when you're a governing body member, you're a Bethelite. And when you're a Bethelite, you are a member of the worldwide order of special full-time servants of Jehovah's Witnesses. This worldwide order has a list of rules. And one of those rules is that when you're in this worldwide order, you're not allowed to receive an income. You effectively make a vow of poverty. You're not allowed to receive money while being in the worldwide order. The only exception is in cases where the order itself exempts someone in a particular case. So effectively, the heads of the worldwide order get to decide if they want to make an exception. And who are the heads of the worldwide order? Well, it's safe to say, I think, that the governing body are right up there, aren't they? When it comes to deciding whether any exceptions should be made. So it seems, or it looks like, Stephen Lett gets a free pass when it comes to making real estate investments while making this vow of poverty. So there's hypocrisy there. There's hypocrisy in him telling millions of Jehovah's Witnesses, many of whom can barely afford to put food on the table, many of whom can barely afford to have a roof over their heads. And he's telling them to not be materialistic. He's telling them to live as temporary residents while he's going in halves on a $500,000 property. I'm sure there are many things Stephen Lett is in a position to lecture us on, but given his personal track record, I'm sorry, materialism just isn't one of them. Of Jesus, Jehovah himself said, This is my son, the beloved, whom I have approved. Listen, to him. But in order to do so obediently as Jehovah's sheep, we must reject the voice of strangers. But how would you handle things if the voice of strangers was brought to you by someone close, a friend, or perhaps even a family member? That's what Jade faces in the following dramatization. How will she learn to reject the voice of strangers in a sensitive situation? Smells wonderful. Mm. Oh wait, I forgot. You should cook every night. If you clean every night. Uh, no, we'll take it in turns. Ta-da! But this looks amazing. Mm. Thanks. It's a practice for my first guest. Really? Who? My mum. That's wonderful. 
we had our first phone call in a year that wasn't a total disaster, so I invited her around tomorrow. It'll go great. So yes, we have the return of Jade and Nita, the stars of the 2020 Always Rejoice convention, are back with us to help impress the importance of avoiding the voice of strangers, making sure that the only voice we listen to is that of Jehovah's organization or the governing body. That's the purpose here. If I had to guess, this is not the last time we'll be seeing Jade and Nita. I think when we see that intro showing various clips from the Jade and Nita dramatizations, followed by the title screen, that indicates to me that they intend to keep revisiting the Jade and Nita storyline, because I think they realize that this is a popular duo. They've managed to find this combination that works well when it comes to the audience finding them believable. Because let's face it, they're good actors. I think that the whoever it is playing Nita and Jade, I think they're genuinely good actors, which is actually quite rare <laughs> when it comes to Jehovah's Witness dramatizations. Anyway, if you haven't done so already, I would urge you to check out my video on the Jade and Nita saga as presented at the Always Rejoice convention. If T-Boy is gracious, a thumbnail will appear to the story of Jade and Nita, how to turn someone into a Jehovah's Witness in 14 steps, because that's essentially the purpose of these characters, or at least it was when we first saw them. Jade was a student who was recruited by Nita after Jade saw Nita doing cart witnessing. And there was a series of dramatizations just brazenly showing the methods of manipulation that Jehovah's Witnesses use to recruit people into the group. And usually, thankfully, these methods, these strategies, I think, don't work on thinking adults with developed critical thinking skills. I think that it's quite unusual. Unless there is some underlying trauma, some kind of emotional issue that Jehovah's Witnesses can pounce upon and exploit, I think for most people, the beliefs, the ideas are just so ludicrous that no amount of manipulation is going to get someone to fall for them. But in the case of Jade and Nita, because it's all fictional, because they can just make things work when it's a dramatization, Jade falls for everything. And now we've fast forwarded in the story to where Jade and Nita are now living together, which I think most of us could see coming at some point. <laughs> They do at least have a chaperone who appears to be living with them, so presumably she's keeping them on the straight and narrow. Anyway, Jade talks about her mother, and she mentions that she had, or they had, our first phone call in a year that wasn't a total disaster. So I invited her round tomorrow. We saw a glimpse of what phone calls between Jade and her mother looked like during the convention dramatizations. Here's a clip. You listen. Isn't this just another of your phases? It's time to move on, love. The holidays are our time. It's all I get from you. Promise me you'll be here. <laughs> So that gives us some idea of what Jade meant when she said total disaster. Phone conversations with her mother 
were a total disaster for a year. Well, that's why. Because the religion she has recently joined drives a wedge between believers and unbelieving family members. It's going to cause friction one way or the other. In this case, the mother simply wanted to see her daughter for Christmas because her daughter was a student. Presumably she's no longer a student because, of course, higher education isn't allowed for Jehovah's Witnesses. Now she's a Jehovah's Witness and she's given up Christmas and she's given up weed. That was another part of the dramatizations. Uh, she'll almost certainly have given up higher education. Goodness knows how an engaged, caring, compassionate, concerned mother would react to such huge changes in their daughter. And so when Jade is referring to friction in the phone conversations, quite frankly, that is justified. Now, what we're going to see as this new dramatization progresses, we're going to see Jade's mother, who is bent on trying to retrieve the critical thinking skills of her daughter. Hi, Mum. Hello, love. Come in. Nice to see you. Nice to see you too. Yeah, let me take that. Oh, thanks, my love. It's fine. Your roommates, you say they're explorers? Pioneers. They preach full-time, but they work part-time. Hmm, I see. But you, you're no, not... No, not yet anyway. Jade, love, all this, I see it's made you a better person. Heaven knows I tried. But I miss bits of the old Jade. Bits? <laughs> what, what bits? Where's the jade that questioned everything? So then she pulls out her phone and starts showing me stuff about witnesses. What kind of stuff? News stories, all negative and slanted. I tried to change the subject, but she just kept at it. See you later, girls. Oh, bye. Bye, Sorry, I, um, I've got to get ready. Jade's mother wants to show her some more links. <laughs> this is going to get interesting, isn't it? So yes, Jade's mother is understandably, I think we can agree, concerned about what's happening to her daughter. I say what's happening, it's more a case of what's happened. Jade has been fully converted to the Jehovah's Witness faith to the point where She's seemingly unable to question anything. There were two points in this particular segment that I found most interesting. The first being... Jade, love. All this. I see it's made you a better person. Heaven knows I tried. But I miss bits of the old Jade. Bits? <laughs> what, what bits? Where's the jade that questioned everything? So right off the bat, the audience is being told that being a Jehovah's Witness makes you a better person than being a non-Jehovah's Witness. 
once you get indoctrinated, once you take on the new personality, your unbelieving family and friends will notice that you've suddenly magically become this new improved version of yourself. Heaven knows I tried, says Jade's mother. So her efforts apparently have come up short when it comes to raising her daughter. What was needed was for Jade to join a cult in order for Jade to be a good person. That is unambiguously the message. And by the way, I don't want to harp on about this too much, but it's a little bit disconcerting for me to watch this particular installment of the Jade and Nita saga because I personally know the actress who is performing the role of Jade's mother. We were friends when I was one of Jehovah's Witnesses. We, I wouldn't say we were close friends, but she worked in the town where I grew up. We shared the same circle of friends. We'd go on days out, on trips to Alton Towers, on walks, all of that sort of thing, all very wholesome. Um, but yeah, we knew each other. And I'm not going to say her surname, but her name is Susie. And in addition to being friends with her, I was also friends with her husband, the gentleman she ended up marrying, and I went to their wedding. So as you can imagine, it's a little bit jarring for me to be watching this when you actually know someone who's in the drama, who's being used in the propaganda. Anyway, that's out of the way. The other thing I wanted to draw to your attention is the following exchange between Jade and Nita. So then she pulls out her phone and starts showing me stuff about witnesses. What kind of stuff? News stories, all negative and slanted. I tried to change the subject, but she just kept at it. This is very interesting. Actually, the whole dramatization is interesting. It's giving us breadcrumbs, or hopefully Jehovah's Witnesses, breadcrumbs to follow that give a major clue as to just how manipulative this group is. When it comes to information about Jehovah's Witnesses, that Jehovah's Witnesses are looking at or reading or watching, it has to be positive. It just has to be positive. It cannot be negative. The problem with the information that Jade's mother was showing Jade was that it was, quote, all negative and slanted. Slanted meaning that the overall impression given of Jehovah's Witnesses was not a favorable one. You then have to ask the question, if you're watching this kind of objectively, well, isn't Jehovah's Witness material about Jehovah's Witnesses slanted? Where are you going to get a Watchtower article or a JW Broadcasting episode where they say, you know what, here are a few times where we goofed up. You know, here's a few times in Jehovah's Witness history where we made some serious mistakes that we regret. Or here are things that we're doing now that we'd like to improve on. And we'd really appreciate your input. Where are you going to get that kind of language in Jehovah's Witness materials, in Jehovah's Witness propaganda? You're not going to get it because it is slanted. It's okay, apparently, for Jehovah's Witness materials to be slanted, but it's not okay for external third-party materials about Jehovah's Witnesses to be in any way slanted or negative. Well, how long are you going to be gone for? I'll stay another month. I told my daughter it's too hot here. <laughs> What's happened to me? <laughs> Abigail? Jade girl, how are you? Been better. Oh, Nita said that your mother visited. I hope you don't mind. No. Mum's driving me mad. It's... 
It's like it's her hobby to ruin my life. Oh, she sounds wonderful. Like me when my daughter got baptised. You opposed your daughter? Oh, mercy, yes. I love her so much and didn't want to lose her. But I'm not going anywhere. Of course not, but a worried mother doesn't know that. Mother, lunch is ready. I got to go, but I have a scripture for you. When you read it, remember, your mum is not the stranger. John chapter 10 and verse 5. They will by no means follow a stranger, but will flee from him, because they do not know the voice of strangers. Mum is not the stranger. It's what she shares. Reject the voice, not her. Did you look at those links that I sent you? Mum, I want us to get together, but I won't hear anything negative about my beliefs. Well, perhaps we just won't talk religion. It's a deal then? All right then. I can see I'm not gonna get anywhere. So what subject do you want to talk about? The deal fell apart fast. Jade, I know we weren't gonna talk religion, but I must tell you this one thing that Mom, I read. I thought we weren't gonna talk about this. It's getting late. I'm gonna go. <sighs> Thanks for dinner. I'll call you tomorrow. If you're watching this as someone who's never been one of Jehovah's Witnesses, there should be multiple red flags. <laughs> already in this dramatization. We've already learned that it would be a terrible thing for a Jehovah's Witness to look at something that's negative, something that isn't slanted in favor of the organization. It's okay to read stuff that's slanted in favor of the organization, just not the opposite. The part I really want to zone in on is this. They will by no means follow a stranger, but will flee from him, because they do not know the voice of strangers. Mum is not the stranger, it's what she shares. Reject the voice, not her. Did you look at those links that I sent you? Mum, I want us to get together, but I won't hear anything negative about my beliefs. Let's start with that last point. Mum, I want us to get together. Do you mean, Jade? Mum, I want us to be able to have a relationship. <laughs> Notice how they use language in such a clever way. It's clearly not just about whether they're getting together or not. It's clearly not just about the occasional meal. It's about whether Jade's mother is allowed to be in her daughter's life. It's about whether they're allowed to have a relationship or not. But the propaganda twists things Apparently, it's apostates who twist things. It's not the organization who would pull this sort of trick, and yet you're seeing it right there in front of you. A relationship between a mother and daughter is merely getting together. 
Mum, I want us to get together, but I won't hear anything negative about my beliefs. So those are the terms that you're expected to accept if you are the mother or father of someone who's just been indoctrinated into the Jehovah's Witness religion. You're supposed to just not talk about the religion if it's anything critical. You're allowed to say positive things. You're allowed to have positive views or ideas about the religion. But you are not, under any circumstances, allowed to show anything negative. How is this not a massive red flag for anyone who's just objectively looking at this religion, who hasn't yet bought into the indoctrination? All of this will make total sense if you're watching this propaganda as a Jehovah's Witness who's already invested years or decades in this. But how is this going to play to a non-Jehovah's Witness impartial, objective observer. They are shooting themselves in the foot by being so overtly culty in their material. And this whole thing about the voice of strangers, which is what all of this is about, and indeed this was the verse that Stephen Lett was referring to in his opening remarks. Who gets to be a stranger and who gets to be a non-stranger would be my question. So apparently, whoever manages to get your attention first is the one you should trust, effectively. I really want you to think about this if you're one of Jehovah's Witnesses in particular. Who gets to be the stranger and who gets to be the familiar voice? Is it just a case of if you get there first, then you're not the stranger? Is it just a case of, oh, if you don't actually physically know somebody or you, you're unfamiliar with them or you don't know exactly what their intentions are, you should automatically dismiss what they're saying. Shouldn't the final arbiter be truth? Shouldn't it be the case that irrespective of whether someone is a stranger or not, irrespective of how familiar you are with a person, what really matters is whether what they're saying is true. Because you could be in an abusive relationship with someone that you've known for years or decades. This person is clearly not a stranger. This person is the opposite of a stranger. But they can still be manipulating you and using you and gaslighting you and making you do things that you wouldn't otherwise wish to do because it suits them. They're not a stranger, but they're very, very dangerous. While on the other hand, you could have someone who you've never met before who wants to help you and who is giving you information that is factually correct and who is giving you arguments that are logical and reasonable and sound. All of this stuff about the voice of a stranger is itself manipulation because the ultimate message underneath all of this is the governing body saying, you know us. You've known us for years. You know the organization. You know your fellow worshippers. Why would we lie to you when we've all known each other for so long? It shouldn't matter how long you've known someone for or how long you've been in an organization for. It's equally likely for someone to lie to you who you know well, who you trust as it is for someone to lie to you who you don't know well. Jade, I got an alert this morning and I'm really Mom, about this. No, I don't... I... 
I was sure this wouldn't work. And then it happened. Jade, I'd like to change our agreement. If I ask you what you believe, you get to answer. Short answers, I won't be converting. <laughs> it's a deal then? Yeah, it's a deal. <laughs> How wise it was for Jade to distinguish between the dangerous falsehoods about Jehovah's people and the person unwittingly promoting them. Jade took a clear stand, but she also patiently showed that she loved her mother. This not only protected Jade from dangerous thinking, but also helped her mother. So there we have it. That's the Jade and Nita comeback. Apparently, if you are the parent of someone who's just been indoctrinated as a Jehovah's Witness, first of all, you need to remember not to say anything negative, not to show anything critical, or share anything critical, I should say, with your believing son or daughter. And second of all, we've learned that it's possible to wear you down <laughs> By insisting on not talking about anything negative, eventually this will have the effect of making you want to have only positive conversations about the religion. So that only your indoctrinated son or daughter gets to share information. You don't get to share negative information, but they get to share positive information. That's apparently how this works. It's, again, hopelessly unrealistic. We're not talking about something that Jehovah's Witnesses or newly converted Jehovah's Witnesses can reasonably expect. We're talking about the fantasy that the governing body imagines in these scenarios. And they can imagine whatever they want. <laughs> They can have any number of ideas about how this sort of situation will play out, but I would humbly suggest that this is not remotely how things would work out in reality. Of course, there will always be exceptions, but by and large, I think what would happen in this situation is that a son or daughter will have a wedge driven between themselves and their parents because which parent is going to be fine with their son or daughter joining a cult and is going to just roll over and refuse to discuss anything critical about the group that's completely taken over the thinking and personality of the darling child which parents going to be fine with that and which parents going to say actually yeah we won't talk about anything critical we'll just talk about positive stuff and you get to preach to me so long as you keep it short it's just not going to happen but what i found most interesting was not necessarily what we saw depicted in the concluding moments of the dramatization, but just the overtly culty rhetoric of Stephen Lett, who has apparently shared all his inhibitions when it comes to being a cult leader, and is just saying it like it is. How wise it was for Jade to distinguish between the dangerous falsehoods about Jehovah's people and the person unwittingly promoting them. What dangerous falsehoods are we talking about, Stephen Letts? We haven't actually heard a single one. That's the whole point. The whole point to begin with was that Jade refused to listen to anything negative about the organization. No examples were given. There was not a single statement 
that we're able at the end of this dramatization to reach a conclusion on as to whether it's true or false. All we've had established in this dramatization is that Jehovah's Witnesses shouldn't listen to anything negative regardless of who's sharing it, regardless of who's unwittingly a tool of Satan in sharing information about Jehovah's Witnesses that doesn't portray them in a flattering light. Apparently, it has nothing to do with whether it's actually true or not. If it's negative, if it portrays Stephen Lett's organization in a negative light, it is automatically untrue and therefore dangerous. And he then goes on to use the word dangerous a second time. This not only protected Jade from dangerous thinking, but also helped her mother. Oh yes, dangerous thinking. You wouldn't want to have thoughts that are dangerous, would you? <laughs> Has Stephen Lett been reading George Orwell? Is he, is he just trying to make the organization conform as much as possible to the dystopian nightmare that George Orwell conjured up in 1984? with groupthink and all of that sort of thing, thought crime, it's right there, isn't it? If it's negative about the organization, if it's not flattering, if it makes you scrutinize your beliefs or subject them to reason and logic, it's not just undesirable. It's not just the voice of strangers. It's not just that you should shut it out and expect others who aren't supposed to follow the rules to also shut it out. You're endangered by this. You're endangered by even thinking about it. Your thoughts are a danger to you. So you must purge your thoughts of anything dangerous, of any dangerous thinking, thought crime. How can you really control what's going on in your brain? As I've said many, many times on this channel, your synapses, your brain chemistry is just going to do its thing. I'm sorry. We're fooling ourselves <laughs> if we can suggest that we have mastery over everything that goes on in your noggin. It's just not how it works. We do have mastery over whether we act on everything that's going on in our brain. But it's completely unrealistic and I would suggest unhealthy to promote this idea that certain thoughts are forbidden, that it's dangerous to have certain thoughts especially if they are thoughts that in any way are inconvenient to a particular set of cult leaders. Unfortunately, as our children grow and attend school, many face a modern scourge, bullying. How can they overcome the fear and negative feelings that being bullied causes? Well, listen to two of our teenagers share what worked for them in this edition of My Teen Life. My experience with bullying ultimately started in physical education with this kid who shared a locker a few spaces away from me, took that opportunity and started to verbally attack me. I first experienced bullying in elementary school, but it was a little stuff, nothing too big. In middle school is when it was really, really something. It was upsetting that I was being bullied. It made me feel like I was doing something wrong. Why did I have to be the target? 
he got really personal. He'd call me names, he would say that, you know, I wasn't good at anything, no one cared about me, that I was dumb, that I was weak. Especially after he found out that I was a witness, then the text just got even more intense. Well, there's a surprise. It turns out being a Jehovah's Witness doesn't play out that well in the schoolyard. Who knew? <laughs> So we've been watching the latest installment of My Teen Life, where two young Jehovah's Witnesses, Stephen Lett claims these are teenagers, but I'm not convinced. I think Stephen Lett is taking the title of the series literally. Usually, in my opinion, what they do is they interview young witnesses in perhaps their early 20s and get them to relate what happened when they were teenagers. Anyway, that's besides the point. What we have here is effectively a faked YouTuber setup where they use the dynamic of the young person sat in their bedroom as though they're speaking really super authentically. They're just sharing their thoughts unfiltered as you would in a YouTube vlog. Only clearly that's not what's happening here. Clearly this is a case of young people in a particular religion being put in front of the camera and effectively told what to say, told what the narrative is or should be. In this case, it's obviously, again, about bullying. And the overall message is that you can overcome bullying if you're one of Jehovah's Witnesses. <laughs> Being a Jehovah's Witness puts you in a unique position to not be troubled by bullying. Clearly, the reality is entirely the opposite. And this isn't in any way to condone those who do bully Jehovah's Witness kids or the children of Jehovah's Witnesses. It's just a fact of life that children can be horrible to each other and children can identify anything that makes their classmate different, especially if it's something controversial, let's say their classmate is in a religion that requires them to knock on people's doors over the weekend, including the doors of their classmates, of course the children of Jehovah's Witnesses are going to be bullied in school. The religion is making things harder, not more easy. But as we're going to see, apparently all you need to do is apply the advice in Jehovah's Witness materials, invoke some scriptures from the Bible and all will be well. My parents always brought up scriptures. Proverbs 27, 12. Anytime I saw the bullies, I would avoid as much as possible. Another thing that I was always doing was praying constantly, always praying before school, during school, after school. There are times when I would go into the library and just read books, just stay to myself. During those times, I would also pray to Jehovah, and he was a friend to me. He was somebody that I could speak to on this matter. I did end up talking to my parents about it. They let me get my side of the story out. They were listening and they wanted to help out, and they made me feel loved. I definitely took this time to reach out to the elders, and they really encouraged me and assured me that that I was not only somewhere where I was needed, I was also somewhere where I was wanted. I took some practical steps. I moved my locker. I made sure not to retaliate. Walking away is something very powerful. Retaliation is something that's weak because you're giving in to your emotions and you're just lashing out. Eventually the bully got suspended, which gave me some peace. Uh, he ended up coming back after a week and he started up again with the attack. I noticed that he hadn't changed at all, but I had. I was much more confident. With that change, I began to fear him less. I wasn't scared of him. I just saw him as this person who wanted attention from me. How is any of this helpful? If you're watching this, 
as a young Jehovah's Witness who's facing bullying on a day-to-day -day basis at school, how is this practically helpful? Let's just look at some of those verses that flashed up. The shrewd person sees the danger and conceals himself, Proverbs 27 verse 12. You need to conceal yourself. <laughs> you need to see the danger. So maybe if you're being bullied, it's your fault for not seeing the danger. <laughs> you, you need to be clairvoyant. You need to be able to anticipate the danger and see it coming. So you need to be shrewd. Maybe if you're being bullied, it's because you're not being shrewd enough and you're not concealing yourself. You need to find some good locations to hide in. That's what you need to do. <laughs> I'm laughing, but internally I'm also kind of crying because this was the terrible advice I was given by my parents, bless them. They thought they were doing the right thing, but they were basing their advice on the organization's publications. My parents told me when I came to them in tears because I was being bullied for being a Jehovah's Witness in the school playground, they told me I should never ever retaliate. And if I were in a situation where, let's say, I was chased into an alleyway and there was only a wall at the end of it. I said, well, what do I do then? They said, try climbing up the wall. I'll never forget that. You're never allowed to retaliate. You're never allowed to stand up for yourself. You can only run. Just run, Forrest, was essentially the advice I was given by my parents. And I got into all sorts of situations, particularly in primary school, because there was like a committed group of lads who made it their business to bully me every lunchtime. And it got to the point where some lunchtimes I would just be endlessly running, just endlessly running, trying to conceal myself because this is the advice I was acting on and it was not working. What other verses are there? Pray constantly. That's going to sort things out. Just pray. If you're being bullied, maybe it's because you're not praying enough. Maybe this is, again, somehow your problem. It's not the fact that the bullies need dealing with. It's your problem because you're not concealing yourself or you're not praying constantly. What's another one? Return evil for evil to no one. Again, this goes back to what I was saying. You're not allowed to retaliate. You're not allowed to stand up for yourself. And by the way, I'm clearly not advocating violence. I'm clearly not suggesting that violence is the answer. But realistically, when you're being physically assaulted, when you're having lumps kicked out of you, on the school playground, there comes a point where it is reasonable, even in the eyes of the school, to just not lie there and take it, to actually stand up for yourself. But that's not the advice you get given. That's not what the verse is saying. That's not what children get told, children of Jehovah's Witnesses. A mild answer turns away rage. Does it now? Is that how it works with children who are being mean in the school playground? Just give them a mild answer. And that's going to turn away the rage. If you're struggling too much with the rage of school bullies, maybe it's because you're not giving them a mild answer. Again, it all just loops back around to you, doesn't it? When you're a Jehovah's Witness in this situation. This whole episode of my teen life is just a train wreck as far as I'm concerned. And that's saying something because they're usually pretty bad. But this is right up there with the worst as far as I'm concerned. I don't understand the upbeat music either. They're talking about bullying. 
they're talking about physical and emotional trauma that children are being put through. And it's this upbeat kind of rock guitar music doesn't work. It doesn't work. And the whole overuse of stock footage as well really irritates me. And this is as someone who uses stock footage themselves in YouTube videos. I have a subscription to a supplier of third-party stock footage, and there is a place for it in videos. But does it have to be just this barrage of stock footage? It feels especially weird coming from an organization that claims to have such an array of creativity and creative resources at its disposal. Jehovah is blessing it in all sorts of ways when it comes to, you know, the filmmaking aspects and video production and the talent at its disposal, and yet it still needs to reach for the third-party stock footage. Anyway, that is a minute issue, a minute grievance compared to the biggest problem I have with this particular My Teen Life, which is the following. I definitely took this time to reach out to the elders and they really encouraged me and assured me that, that I was not only somewhere where I was needed, I was also somewhere where I was wanted. So one of the things that Charlie finds most helpful when dealing with bullying is to reach out to the elders. And when he's regaling us with this story, we get some footage that isn't third-party stock footage. They are using footage from a previous JW Broadcasting episode, and I forget the story. But the way the footage is being used, and maybe Tibor can overlay it, we're seeing a young person in the context of what Charlie's saying, approaching an elder for advice. And in the footage, you don't see any parents around. He's not approaching the elder with his parents, with his mum and dad by his side. He is approaching the elder all by himself for advice on something that's of deep concern to him, something that's causing him emotional distress. What about the repeated assurances that the Christian Congregation of Jehovah's Witnesses gave ICSA, the Independent Inquiry into Child Sexual Abuse, that there is never a time when children are separated from their parents in Jehovah's Witness worship. They made that claim over and over again. Not just when Paul Gillies was giving his testimony, but even in the pre-hearing, Shane Brady, the lawyer for Christian Congregation of Jehovah's Witnesses, said the following. Well, there's a religion, we are family focused. We do not sponsor any activity that separates children from parents. Also, we don't sponsor any activities that separate children from their parents. And as a result, it minimizes the opportunities for abuse. He was allowed to get away with it. He was allowed to lie to a public inquiry and say there are never any situations where children are alone with members of a Jehovah's Witness congregation, with, say, the elders. Even though we've seen portrayed for us in Jehovah's Witness materials just one of many situations where children are alone with members of the congregation and indeed are encouraged, in this case, to seek out an elder for advice all by themselves. All the principles that you read about, whether young people ask, scriptures that you pick out, everything really, really helps. And you can either see the situation die down, or it's not as bad, you can deal with it, or it just stops. And it was so encouraging for me 
and it helped strengthen my faith in seeing how Jehovah really is there to help. Don't keep this to yourself. Don't bottle it up because that'll make things worse. This is a problem that won't go away because you ignore it. You need to talk to someone. Talk to your parents, talk to your friend, talk to Jehovah, talk to someone in the congregation. Because if you don't know what to do, they'll help you find out what to do and they'll give you guidance. And you'll be so impressed by how much Jehovah takes care of you and he'll show you that you are loved by him. You are loved by Jehovah. So if you're suffering at the hands of a bully, don't bottle it up. You are not alone. Talk to your parents. It won't go away if you ignore it. But Jehovah can help you face up to bullies and you can trust Bible principles because they always work. Yes, Bible principles always work, like the principles about how to take better care of your slave or the principle of women being silent in the congregation. And then there's that principle about how gay people should be stoned. Yes, so many Bible principles that always work. Well, thank goodness this particular installment of my teen life is over. Again, I would just simply make the argument, if we're talking about a child of Jehovah's Witnesses and a child who doesn't come from a Jehovah's Witness family, which of the two are more likely to be bullied, especially given the fact that children of Jehovah's Witnesses are supposed to preach in school? They are literally tasked with trying to indoctrinate their classmates and teachers. How is that going to help? You know, the overall message here is supposed to be that your teen life will be better if you are a Jehovah's Witness teen, if you're in the Jehovah's Witness religion, because suddenly you get to apply all of these Bible verses that you don't have access to if you're not one of Jehovah's Witnesses. It's just manifestly rubbish and what I especially object to is the way the expectations of Jehovah's Witness teens or children of Jehovah's Witness families, the way their expectations are inflated to a completely unrealistic degree. And you can either see the situation die down or it's not as bad, you can deal with it, or it just stops. Sometimes it's just going to stop. It's just going to stop completely. The bullying is just going to disappear. Poof. It's just going to go. Because suddenly you have all of these brilliant scriptures that you're applying. You're learning how to conceal yourself. <laughs> you're learning how to see the calamity before it happens. You're learning how to not react. You're learning how to say nice things to people and calm them down with your words, like some kind of weird Jedi mind trick. And if it doesn't make the bullying die down or lessen, it will make the bullying stop entirely. Again, completely unrealistic expectations that are only going to make things worse if you are a young Jehovah's Witness dealing with bullying. Because not only are you dealing with the bullying, you're also dealing with this idea that your religion is somehow supposed to help you, even though in many cases, it's the religion that's making things worse. Eventually, I stumbled upon the punk rock anarchist scene, and this really called out to me because here I can be myself, I can establish my own standards, but that scene eventually led me down to a very dark path of uh, immorality, drug abuse, drunkenness, and a lot of violence. Uh, I felt lonely, I felt betrayed, I felt nothing made sense. I remember thinking back on the, when I was learning about Jehovah and how simple things were. I decided to give Jehovah another shot. 
Reading Matthew 16, 24 hit me really hard, or where it says that to disown yourself. Because I knew that scripture, but I still haven't really focused on what it meant for me. I knew I had to let go of certain parts of my personality, of my old lifestyle. Never really given Jehovah a complete fair chance. And so I started applying more fully the principles I found, started trusting Jehovah more. Very quickly, things started falling into place. The determination that I had to serve Him, the changes that I needed to make, changes that I never thought I could. All the time that I spent pursuing my own interests, it always led to disappointment. And now that I've learned about Jehovah and living by His principles, I have been having the time of my life. To know that Jehovah just simply wants to make me the best version of me and teach me to enhance my personality and to become better, that really endeared me to Jehovah. Isn't it wonderful that Jehovah cares so much that He takes the time to mold our thinking and help us be the best possible version of ourselves? Yes, Stephen, it's wonderful to have your thinking molded for you. It's, it's wonderful to be given a different personality so that you can be a different person, so that you're not the person that you started out as, but instead become someone different. Because who needs to be themselves? Being yourself sucks, doesn't it? <laughs> who wants to have their authentic personality when they can have a personality assigned to them, which is what's being described? in the segment we've just been watching. And to be clear, in the original segment, there are three people who are interviewed. Joel Adams, Garrick Diaz, and Lars Carlson. And we've just been hearing from Garrick Diaz. I've focused in on his story. Garrick Diaz is apparently from Aruba, and I focused in on his story because, I mean, it just completely screams cults, doesn't it? He's literally talking there about how wonderful it was to disown himself. Reading Matthew 16, 24 hit me really hard, or where it says that to disown yourself. Because I knew that scripture, but I still haven't really focused on what it meant for me. I knew I had to let go of certain parts of my personality, of my old lifestyle. Yeah, you see, you need to let go, Garrick. Let go of certain parts of your personality. You need to disown yourself. Just get rid of yourself and become a new you. Become a new, improved version of Garrick Diaz. That's what it means to be. A Jehovah's Witness. I keep saying this, I don't even need to make the argument that it's a cult when they include stuff like this. And what was it we heard earlier from Stephen Lett about soft background music? Soft background music makes it hard to consider her course to be bad. Okay, so soft background music can be used to manipulate the way we feel about what someone is saying. To know that Jehovah just simply wants to make me the best version of me and teach me to enhance my personality and to become better, that really endeared me to Jehovah. Was that soft background music? Sounded like soft background music to me. As this month's music video asks, to whom? Could I go away? Enjoy this faith-strengthening original song. Listen to Jesus. 
Jesus in these troublesome days. He lights up my path as I hear and obey. He is the fine shepherd and he shows me the way. He guides every step, never leads me astray. Why should I ever listen to voices in opposition? Those who would make me stray from the path I'm on today. To it to them they've done it they have finally reached peak cringe factor <laughs> as far as i'm concerned with this new music video from the september jw broadcasting episode for 2022 yeah the voice of the stranger must be avoided and one way we do this of course is by interrupting our class on evolution <laughs> by standing up while we're being taught about the science of evolution and giving a lecture of our own, because of course we know better, or Jehovah's Witnesses know better than scientists when it comes to human origins, when it comes to the mechanisms by which life on our planet abounds. Who needs science? We have the Bible to tell us everything that we need to know on this subject. So the voice of the stranger, if you think about it, this is really messed up. We began this JW Broadcasting episode learning that the voice of the stranger is basically the voice of apostates or the voice of the media when they're telling us negative things about Jehovah's Witnesses but now, in this music video, To Whom Could I Go Away, the voice of the stranger has just been further broadened to encompass teachers. <laughs> teachers and scientists are now the strangers that we shouldn't listen to. And how ironic that we're getting this music video showing a young Jehovah's Witness standing up in the classroom and lecturing the class with Jehovah's Witness indoctrination about the origin of life, when we've only just had an episode of My Teen Life on the subject of bullying, talking about how being a Jehovah's Witness makes it so much easier for you to avoid bullying. Are we not seeing in this music video a classic example of how the children of Jehovah's Witnesses get themselves in bullying situations? This is how it happens because they go to school with a mission given to them by their parents and by the organization of recruiting their classmates and interrupting their teacher if their teacher starts to talk about evolution. So thank you for showing that so clearly, governing body. I thought it might be worthwhile before we continue with this music video, which I'm trying to spare you from watching as much as possible, but it is a really interesting example of manipulation and how proud they are of stifling outside voices, I did just want to share some of the lyrics before we move on. In fact, I'll just read them. 
I have listened to Jesus in these troublesome days. He lights up my path as I hear and obey. He is the fine shepherd and he shows me the way. He guides every step, never leads me astray. Why should I ever listen to voices in opposition? Those who would make me stray from the path I'm on today. To whom should I go away? Where could I turn in times of trouble? To whom could I go away? I think what they're doing is invoking the verse in John 6, verse 68, where it says, Simon Peter answered him, Lord, whom shall we go away to? You have sayings of everlasting life. That's the scripture that tends to be wheeled out for Jehovah's Witnesses whenever they are warning about apostates. They invoke this verse as if to say, well, we're the ones who are promising you life in paradise. If you listen to apostates, what do they have to offer? As though it's some kind of competition, as though it's a case of who's going to give you the best offer? It's some kind of bartering, apparently, that apostates are engaged in. No, no, no. What I'm offering, or what apostates are offering, apostate activists, apostate writers, apostate YouTubers, what we're offering is the freedom to think for yourself. We don't have to offer you everlasting life. You can have that in any religion, in almost any religion. If you want to believe in everlasting life, take your pick of religions that promise you that. But with minimal digging, what you'll find is that out of the plethora of religions offering everlasting life, among the most harmful, among the most abusive, among the most manipulative, are Jehovah's Witnesses. To whom could I go away? Where could I turn in times of trouble? To whom could I go away? The voice of the stranger leads only to danger. It's Jesus' words I Certainly, that's how we all feel. Never do we want to stray from the great shepherd Jesus Christ as he leads us through the end of this trouble system of things. May this song encourage us to stick close to Jehovah's organization no matter what befalls us. I think Stephen Lett, this particular music video might have the opposite effect to the one you're intending. I think that rather than strengthening the resolve of Jehovah's Witnesses, in at least some cases, it's going to be the straw that breaks the camel's back. Because it's just blatant, isn't it? They're asking for your entire life. That's ultimately, if you watch the whole music video, what this is about. You follow a Jehovah's Witness from when he's young, from when he's getting baptized, all the way through his school and making a stand on evolution, all the way through to, in his later years, preaching, doing car witnessing, and along the way, you'll have noticed, he takes a stand on the blood issue. That's when the doctors go into the room with their chart, showing the heart and showing some bags of blood, which is typically how a doctor would tell you that you need blood to save your life. They do it with a massive illustration. <laughs> okay, 
cutting them some slack. They're trying to depict something in a music video. So, of course, they're going to do it in pictures rather than words. But even so, that whole scene and indeed the entire flow of the story is about sacrificing your life, either literally when it comes to refusing blood transfusions or in terms of just your entire time on this planet being exhausted in serving an organization that you're not allowed to stray from. You don't have a choice once you're baptized. Once you've pledged your life to the Jehovah's Witness religion, it's your life that they take. And you're not allowed to question things. You're not allowed to listen to the voice of strangers, which leads only to danger, stranger danger. <laughs> Those lyrics, seriously, they're just not even trying now, are they? The rhetoric is so black and white and so predictable. But ultimately, my question would be, do you even have a choice? When it comes to straying, it's simply not something that can happen. Either in your own mind, because you believe you're going to die at Armageddon if you question the leadership, or in the here and now, in reality, because you dread being separated from your family through shunning simply for questioning the leaders. In our following video, please note how the governing body has always worked to maintain unity in behalf of the worldwide brotherhood. No, I'd have known us. But uh, I'm getting along all right. There's a little tumor here in the brain, which the doctors are treating. And uh, whatever comes, uh, one way or the other. Uh, but it has been uh, wonderful to work with you all these years. And I enjoy it tremendously. And I'm very grateful to Joe that I could come to this meeting and be with you. Like C.T. Russell before him, Brother Knorr had an exceptional gift for organizing the kingdom work. That set the stage for the amazing growth that the organization experienced during the closing decades of the 20th century. Nathan Knorr died on June 8, 1977. Note what Brother Albert Schroeder, a fellow member of the governing body, wrote about him. As the society's principal administrator, there have come to be over 90 branches. Brother Knorr has proved to be the right theocratic entrepreneur for this period of Jehovah's Kingdom work. We're watching the JW Broadcasting episode for September 2022, and specifically, this is a segment with the theme, The Governing Body Preserves Unity. This is actually part two. We've already had part one, and now we're in part two of a series of videos intended to impress upon Jehovah's Witnesses the need for a governing body in terms of creating unity in the organization. But as I commented on part one, the problem you have whenever you try to revise history, whenever you try to whitewash things as the Jehovah's Witness leadership, is that history has a way of not allowing you to whitewash it. You know, you can put a certain spin on things. You can give Jehovah's Witnesses the impression that there has always been a governing body. But then the more you show history, the more you 
show recordings of talks and photographs and film footage, archive footage, you name it, the more it's just going to become obvious that what you're saying is wrong or misleading. And here we have a perfect example of that because what we've seen in the opening moments of part two of this series is just a tribute to Nathan Knorr. Remember, this is supposed to be about a governing body, a collective, a group of men who don't seek prominence. They're not about drawing attention to themselves or, you might argue, their predecessors. They're interested in directing all attention to Jesus. But is that really what we've just seen? It seems to me that this is effectively a love letter to Nathan Knorr. And there's even a point at which they acknowledge that Nathan Knorr, rather than a governing body, was the one who was administrating things. Note what Brother Albert Schroeder, a fellow member of the governing body, wrote about him. As the society's principal administrator, there have come to be over 90 branches. Brother Noor has proved to be the right theocratic entrepreneur for this period of Jehovah's Kingdom work. Where is the governing body in all of that? Apparently, Nathan Noor was the right theocratic entrepreneur. <laughs> Apparently, that's a thing now. There's such a thing as theocratic entrepreneurs. They should have like a theocratic dragon's den, shouldn't they? <laughs> Where would-be theocratic entrepreneurs pitch their ideas to a panel of other theocratic entrepreneurs to see whether their ideas are good enough. Anyway, not only was he the right theocratic entrepreneur, but he was also the society's principal administrator. Where is there space for a governing body there? Either you have a group of men who are acting under the guidance and leadership of Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit, or you have a principal administrator. It seems fairly obvious here that at a point in the organization's past, there was no governing body, there was a principal administrator or president who was essentially the cult leader, who decided everything. And that's exactly what Nathan Knorr was. It was only towards the end of his life that the governing body arrangement took hold in a sequence of events that's beautifully explained in Crisis of Conscience by Raymond Franz. But I also think it's worth noting that in this particular segment, is it me or are they trying to erase Joseph Rutherford from the organization's history? Like C.T. Russell before him, Brother Knorr had an exceptional gift for organizing the kingdom work. Like C.T. Russell before him, yes, it was C.T. Russell and then it was Brother Nor. Only it wasn't, was it? <laughs> there was someone in between. Who are you missing out? Joseph Franklin Rutherford. Maybe I'm reading too much into things, but this seems to me to be quite deliberate. I think that the penny might finally be dropping for the organization about Joseph Rutherford and what an objectively grotesque specimen of a human being he was. I mean, there's just so much stuff on him in his own writings, even if we're thinking about the Declaration of Facts, for example, and its outrageously anti Semitic language. I mean, how do you conceal how awful Joseph Rutherford was? I think the organization might be realizing this now and their solution 
is to talk about him as little as possible, even to the point where in their narration, they're fast forwarding through the timeline and skipping straight from Charles Taze Russell to Nathan Knorr. Just imagine, after decades of such difficult persecution, we experience the opportunity to be together with our worldwide brotherhood and to see the brothers from the governing body. It was an unforgettable time. It was the happiest of times. It was super. One outstanding convention was held in Zagreb. Yes, it was a loving and a courageous decision of the governing body to go there despite the uncertainty of the political situation in the country and maybe coming up a civil war. This convention was the only public event that was allowed by the government in the city of Zagreb. All other public events were cancelled, but the Convention of Jehovah's Witnesses not. Policemen and soldiers signed to keep security and order in the stadium. They were astonished that Serbians, Croats, Slovenians, Montenegrins, Bosnians were sitting together in peace and in unity. At those international conventions in Eastern Europe, members of the governing body gave the final motivating talk. And those talks, given less than five months after the thrill of obtaining legal recognition for our work in the Soviet Union, strengthened and encouraged our brothers for trials they would face in the future. It's plain to see that the governing body of years past expended themselves to know well the appearance of the flock. They poured themselves out like a drink offering in order to take good care of the sheep. The same deep love and tender concern for you, the sheep of the Great Shepherd's flock, has been evident throughout modern times right down to this day. What striking evidence of unity our conventions provide. If you say so, Stephen. So, we've just been watching the end of the segment, The Governing Body Preserves Unity, Part 2. We started with a love letter to Nathan Knorr, and now we've switched to this being all about the governing body. As far as I'm concerned, this is pretty much governing body worship at this point. We started off with worship of Nathan Knorr, we're ending with worship of the governing body. Isn't it supposed to be about worship of God? Isn't it supposed to be about following Jesus? What's all this stuff about men, about following men? I keep saying it, this religion becomes more and more unrecognizable with almost each video they release. This sort of propaganda, I'm not going to say it would have been impossible when I was younger, but it certainly would have been a jolt, especially that moment where you have Anthony Johnson and maybe Tibor can overlay. We saw this in part one of the series. You have Anthony Johnson from the United States branch, standing in a room with painted portraits behind him. I think the one on the left is Nathan Knorr, the one in the middle is Fred Franz, and the one on the right is Milton Henschel. I don't want to repeat myself too much, but how is this not idolatry? They have had an artist in their art department devote hours or days or, I don't know, weeks, I don't know how long, how long it takes to paint these paintings, but commit all of this time to painting a picture, not of some Bible scene, not of Jesus, not of Moses or whatever, but of Nathan Knorr, of Fred Franz, of Milton Henschel, of human leaders. It's exactly the sort of portrait you might expect to see in the White House of a former president. That's how they are viewing 
past members of the governing body. If you think about it, all of this is utterly self-indulgent because the message the current governing body are sending in this video to future leaders of the organization is this is how we want to be remembered. Perhaps like many, you're still talking about last year's drama. Daniel, a lifetime of faith. What moving lessons and awesome depictions of visions and events from his life. Would you like to take a look behind the scenes and see what went into making it? Let's enjoy a tour of some of the work that helped bring this account to life. Many costumes and props were carefully handmade for the production. Spearheads were hand forged. Most of the filming was done at Mount Ebo Studios in Brewster, New York. Some additional scenes were filmed in nearby locations and in Florida. You need to rest. As filming was completed, scenes were edited together, and the visual effects team went to work on many specialized shots. Digital models of people and animals were animated and combined with footage of real environments to make scenes that would have been impossible to film otherwise. For example, a digital model was made of the immense image in King Nebuchadnezzar's dream. The team researched the characteristics of the actual materials described in the scriptures, such as metals and rocks, so that when the image falls, it appears realistic and believable. Just look at the results of thousands of hours spent modeling, animating, simulating, rendering, and compositing. What did you see? Hours of hard work? Dramatic visual effects? Bible characters brought to life on screen? Isn't it amazing how they all combine to make what happened thousands of years ago seem so real, so vivid, and faith-strengthening? There's a bit of a Freudian slip there, isn't there? Stephen Lett has just said, in summarizing the work that went into the Daniel drama, the feature film that was shown at last year's convention, he said, isn't it amazing how they all combine to make what happened thousands of years ago seem so real, so vivid, and so faith-strengthening? It needs to seem real. Well, either it's real or it isn't. <laughs> Either it happened or it didn't. It shouldn't be a case of making it seem real. It should be a case of reenacting something that happened. But you can't call it a reenactment. You can only call it a depiction. Because, as I've said many, many times on this channel, what's described in the book of Daniel isn't history. It's a forgery. It's a book that was compiled by people who wanted to share a narrative regarding this awesome character named Daniel. The problem they had, and maybe if Tibor is gracious, a thumbnail will appear to a relevant sushi where I talk about this in more detail. The problem they had was that they didn't seem to have a very good grasp of Neo-Babylonian history, and it showed. So Daniel was supposed to be this super-duper powerful man who had 
all of these privileges and responsibilities. And yet apparently he couldn't get the order of kings right. And there were certain other things in the book of Daniel that were just historically inaccurate because we know so much about that period in history thanks to how well preserved the documents, the clay documents are from that time period. So I have all sorts of issues with the Daniel film that I'm not going to go into all over again. Suffice to say, I actually find it quite interesting to see how this stuff gets put together. And I've given you an abridged version because the actual version is much, much longer. But as someone whose job it is to make video content, I can't help but find it interesting <laughs> to see what goes into these productions. They've admitted here that it took, quote, thousands of hours modeling, animating, simulating, not stimulating, <laughs> simulating, rendering and compositing. I guess you need to judge for yourselves whether it was worthwhile. Is this Daniel film something that will stand the test of time? Is it something that future generations will look back on as a work of genius? As something that was truly groundbreaking? As something that was truly needed and relevant? Or will it get lost in the sands of time? Will it get tossed on the scrap heap of fundamentalist Christian propaganda movies? I think it's more likely to be the latter, personally. But there's also an interesting dynamic here. They are showing what they're capable of doing with the Mount Ebo complex. You saw how lavish their sets are. And not only were they filming at Mount Ebo on their massive sound stages, but they were also going out on location. Maybe if Tibor is gracious, you'll see some footage of some poor Bethelite who got the gig of being in a pond <laughs> or being in some kind of body of water while he was filming. Sadistically, I'd, I'd love there to be a time when Tibor has to do a job like that. Sorry, Tibor. But yeah, that's what they're capable of doing, apparently, with what they have now, with their Mount Ebo complex and with the filmmaking and creative resources at their disposal. And yet they need more. Apparently, everything that we've seen in terms of what they can do with their movie making magic, with their filmmaking prowess, isn't enough. They need Ramapo. They need donations for Ramapo. They need volunteers for Ramapo. They need to build this fabulous new complex that's apparently not going to be ready until 2026, even though Armageddon is imminent. They need more. All of what we've seen isn't enough. And I think that itself begs some questions, doesn't it? Surely that's enough. Surely Mount Ebo and what they already have is enough. The truth is, when you look at what they've said about Ramapo and their justifications for Ramapo, it all comes down to convenience. Oh, we don't want our Bethelites the governing body. Um, we don't want our Bethelites traveling too far. We'd rather have everything in one nearby location because Ramapo is close to the world headquarters. Well, how come individual Jehovah's Witnesses need to be willing to make sacrifices and inconvenience themselves to the point of crossing crocodile-infested rivers and going to all sorts of acrobatics to make sure that meetings are attended and talks are given and what have you. But when it comes to Bethelites, it's a different standard. Bethelites, and it seems the governing body, need to have everything on a plate. They need to have their conveniences. 
But that's everything I have to say about the September 2022 JW Broadcasting episode. There was a lot, wasn't there? This was one of the most interesting episodes I've ever done a rebuttal to. It really has been brazen in how controlling the organization is in their craving and their lust to block out criticism and make sure Jehovah's Witnesses never stray from the bosom of the governing body. So thank you, governing body, for making everything so blatant and again, effectively doing my job for me. But that's all we have time for please don't forget to subscribe to the Lloyd Evans channel for similar videos. And as always, thank you for watching.